Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at human sexuality and gender identity. My guest is Professor Stanley Krippner, who is the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University. Dr. Krippner is the author of over a thousand academic papers in many diverse topics. He has edited and authored dozens of books, and he is a fellow of the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. Welcome, Stanley. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And when we talk about human sexuality. It is uh, an enormously diverse subject. I mean, we think that there are two sexes, for example, but I suspect that, that there are many, many more distinctions that could be made besides simply male and oh, female. Oh, good heavens. Some societies have three, four, five, or six genders, absolutely. You mentioned Alan Watts' professorship. Yes. One of Alan Watts's best books, and some people consider it his best book, is Nature, Man, and Woman. Mm. And that explored dimensions of sexuality which was way ahead of its time. Now, as is true with my other academic interests, my interest in sexuality goes back to my youth. When I was in high school, we had two teachers who came at the same time to the high school, and it was widely known that they were lovers. Oh. Yeah, this is my first contact with lesbians. And much to my delight, looking back, they were not stigmatized, people knew about their relationship, and no big deal was made about it. People talked mm -hmm. about it, but really not in derisive terms because they were so popular and such good teachers. In Fort Atkinson, in the, Wisconsin. Yes, in the 1940s, the late 1940s. So I got off to a good start in terms of not stigmatizing people mm -hmm. whose sexual identities were and sexual preferences were different than conventional thinking. Well, I think it's fair to say that here in uh, North America and Western society, civilization in general, we've come an enormous distance since the 1940s as regards the public discussion and acceptance of uh, the wide variety of ways in which sexuality expresses itself. Well, we certainly have. And as is often true, Western society thinks in terms of black and white, male, female. No, it's not that simple. One is, not always, one is usually born male or female. This is sex. But one can sometimes choose another gender. This is a difference between sex and gender. Mm -hmm. Or society will choose that for them. So sex is one thing, gender is another thing. Even in terms of birth, sometimes it's what we call a hermaphrodite, where a child is born with sexual organs of both sexes. Mm -hmm. And in some indigenous societies, this is fine. They are considered very, very special people. They often become shamans, of all things. The saying goes, well, the Great Spirit took special pains to create this unique person. We should honor them. In the United States, a decision is made early in life to amputate one set sex organ or another yes. and to raise that person accordingly. Sometimes a great mistake is made. Mm -hmm. John Money, who I knew, a brilliant sexologist, was faced with making a decision. There were, uh, if I recall correctly, twins born, a boy and a girl. The boy had some female no, pardon me. The boy had very, very small and damaged penis and testicles. So the decision was made to remove them and raise him as a girl. Mm. John Money, as was true at that time, back in the 1940s, early 1950s, society conditioning was all. You could take a child and you could raise the child either male or female. 
that uh, conditioning mm -hmm. was all important. Behaviorism, the idea the, of... This is the legacy of behaviorism. The tabula rasa. Absolutely. So that poor kid was raised as a girl, was never happy with the girl role, preferred masculine sports. Yes, looked like a girl, was dressed like a girl, and his parents were doing the best. In his late teens, he just absolutely rebelled. And so finally, the parents told him the truth, and he was infuriated, just absolutely infuriated, insisted on living the rest of his life as a man. Mm -hmm. It was too late. He got married. He married a young woman who had children of her own, thought this would end everything very happily. But the transition back to his genetic sex never worked, and he killed himself. I see. Well, there are many suicides and, and murders amongst people who don't conform to conventional societal oh, expectations. Oh, far too many, far too many. There are, and I've known a few of them, even going back to high school, a uh, young man who I knew, who now I realize was gay, tried very hard. He had pastoral counseling, not psychotherapy, but the psychotherapist at that time wouldn't have been much better. Yeah, he ended up killing himself. And it was a great loss. He was such a sensitive, uh, intelligent young man. You know, I have to give credit to Lady Gaga and her song, Born That Way. Yes. That has saved countless numbers of lives in the organization that she founded. I just think of the poor teenagers who killed themselves before her movement started, who have benefited so much from that line of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I know parents who disowned their children now who regret it because the children went and killed themselves. So we're talking here about very vital life and death matters. Well, you began uh, your interest in sexology, as I recall, by working with uh, one of the medical doctors who was amongst the first to institute the sex change operations. That's right. It's called gender reassignment surgery. When I was an undergraduate, Christine Jorgensen made the news. She had gone to Denmark, changed from a man to a woman. What did my psychology professor? Oh, she's schizophrenic. She's psychotic. Nonsense. She actually, I never met her personally. I have friends who met her. She lived out her life as a woman and had a very, very happy life and was not psychotic at all. So she was a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. The American surgeon and physician who brought sexual assign reassignment surgery to America was Harry Benjamin. He became a close friend of mine. And actually, one of my very first articles on sexuality was written with Harry. He had files of all of the people, both male to female and female to male. And I went through those files, looked for the demographic variables in terms of socioeconomic classes, age at which they realized that they wanted to be the other gender, a number of siblings. By and large, they all came from families with no notable characteristics, no sexual abuse, no uh, unusual mental illness in the family. As far as I'm concerned, they were born that way. There was something in their genetic makeup that differed mm -hmm. from their given sexual assignment at birth and their sexual chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And we still don't know too much about why that is. All we know is that some people are so determined to cross gender lines with or without the surgery that they cannot live a happy life without that reassignment, whether it's surgery or not. I understand it has something to do with the way the brain is formed after birth. That's very possible. It could be an afterbirth phenomena because the brain is so complicated. It goes through so many changes. The internal hormones have to interact just in the right way. Mm -hmm. I think that there can be both pre-birth and after-birth birth, uh, hormonal uh, interactions. Some people say, well, it's the hormones of the mother that influence the fetus. Well, we'll have to follow this closely. Yeah. The reality is that there are people suffering because they believe that they're in the wrong gender. They're a male in a female's body or they're a female in a male's body. Mm -hmm. And that's where things stand right now. Marshall McLuhan, who I met and knew to some extent. Yes, the famous uh, media critic. Media expert, right. Yeah. 
The medium he, is the message. Oh, that was his famous book. He once mm-hmm. told me, you know, in the future, there will be so many ways that one can be a man, so many ways that one can be a woman, that this whole business of cross-gender identity will fade into the background. He might be right, but that day has not yet arrived. Yeah. Well, we should make a distinction between gender identity on the one hand and sexual preference on the other. We certainly should. Sexual preference is the gender that somebody is sexually attracted toward, whether it's male, female, or bisexual. Mm -hmm. So, as a result, we have the famous uh, lesbian, gay, um, bisexual, and transgender constellation. Yes. And sometimes people will add Q for questioning or queer or something Mm -hmm. else. Because there are other options. Yes, there are many options. Well, in fact, I interviewed a friend of yours who was a famous sexologist, Albert Ellis. Oh, good heavens, yes. He loved to say that any person could be attracted in six different ways. It could be an animal. It could be an object. He is so right. Mm -hmm. Albert Ellis had a great influence on me. We were friends for nearly half a century. Mm -hmm. And I have this beautiful letter from him. Uh, say we'll be friends forever, and we cherished each other's friendship so much, and I learned so much from him. When I was at the University of Wisconsin, there was one of his books circulating, Sex Without Guilt, Mm -hmm. impacted me, impacted other students. Little did I know that I would later become a close friend of the author. Mm -hmm. Life has many surprises for us. Yes. Yes, he was a great pioneer. He was one of the founders of Quadruple S, the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. And then after his passing, I got to know his widow, Debbie Ellis, and fortunately, she is carrying on his work. Yes, and I've had the pleasure of interviewing her only a few months ago. You are so lucky. You may be one of the few who has interviewed both the Ellises. Yes, and and I do feel fortunate, even though I have to say, uh, as a parapsychologist, uh, Albert Ellis was more or less on the skeptical side. And uh, uh, I'm glad to say it never became an issue between us, and I understand it never became an issue in your friendship No, with it didn't, and Debbie tried to soften him up on the topic, by the yeah. way. And I think she was partially successful because he loved her so much. Mm -hmm. But surely the idea of uh, being open-minded and tolerant of various uh, forms of sexual expression uh, is not unrelated to the idea of being open-minded and tolerant to various forms of psychic expression. Well, you're absolutely right. People can be so closed-minded to any number of unusual phenomena. And again, one of my career goals has been to depathologize and demystify unusual experiences that people have. Of course, if they do something harmful, if they cross the line in terms of bullying people, uh, killing people, uh, um, ridiculing people, No, that is something that I'm very intolerant about. And that, of course, applies to the field of sexuality, where people who are gender non-conforming have actually not only been bullied, but have been killed, or who've been driven to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, I suppose one of my personal contributions to the literature, getting back to Harry Benjamin, the article that we wrote together about the background of transgender people, who were about to have the operation one way or the other. Mm -hmm. We also did a study of the dreams of male to female uh, transgender people. And we couldn't find enough female to male dreams, so we focused on the male to female dreams. Now, I've done a lot of studies on dreams in dreams from seven different countries And there sort of is a typical male dream and a typical female dream. Varies from country to country, of course. Mm -hmm. But in America, more women dream about family and home, makeup, cosmetics. Males dream more about work, about the out of doors, about weapons, etc. You know, what you dream about is what you do during the day. So this is no surprise. 
Now, when we examine these dreams from the transgender sample, they were right down the middle. Mm. You would look at the dream. Yeah, in some ways these are typical male dreams. In some ways these are typical female dreams. And right down the middle. So the dreams really established that their desire to become a member of the other gender were not momentary lapses. They were not a matter of even uh, confused um, identity. It's something that they felt so deeply, that was so deeply in their unconscious that it showed up in their dreams. Now, what about bisexuals? One would expect that they would be in that same category. I have never studied the dreams of bisexuals. I really don't have the answer to that question. Wouldn't that be a fascinating topic? It would be. It used to be thought that people, no, they really weren't bisexual. They really favored one gender or the other for sexual attraction. No, we don't believe that anymore. Now there's a journal of bisexuality. There's a lot of research done with bisexuals. Yes, there are some people who are more or less equally attracted to both genders mm -hmm. for some reason or another. So that's really a legitimate category of its own. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked uh, in another interview about the Jungian notion of the subconscious mind, that yes. uh, uh, it expresses the opposite of the uh, sexual identity of the persona, the outward personality. So, if I'm outwardly male, my psyche, my inner being would be have an animus. It would be, uh, excuse me, anima. That's right. The That's female. not the whole of your unconscious, but it's a very important part very of your unconscious. Very important part. Uh, June Singer, uh, as I recall, a well-known Jungian whom I've had the pleasure Good friend of, of, mine, by the way. of yes. interviewing. Yes, a lovely lady wrote a book on hermaphrodism. That's right. And uh, Androgyny. And or androgyny. You right. are correct. Androgyny, which is not quite the same as no, hermaphrodism. No. But the point being that the soul, the depth aspect of the human psyche is neither male nor female, or is both male and female. Absolutely, yes. So it strikes me, Stanley, that as a person opens up psychically, spiritually, they become uh, in touch with what we might call higher consciousness, they're going to become aware of this. Yes. It's, it's a natural thing to do, but a person who is so identified with one gender identity or another is going to be frightened by that. In fact, as I recall, Freud wrote that paranoia itself was caused by males getting in touch with the um, inner female and being so frightened by that that it, it caused them to have a psychotic break. Oh, well, I think that as usual, Freud was not 100% right, but he was making a good case, and I certainly think there's a lot to that particular theory, mm -hmm. yes. And let's face it, many of the paranoid people who I have known have been very threatened by their male or their female side and refuse to integrate that into their psyche. Mm -hmm. And it spills off of the paranoia that people are out to get them or that certain groups are uh, inimical to them or that uh, they're the victim of a conspiracy. Yeah, some of these paranoid fantasies have sexual roots. Well, would you say that the converse is true, that a person who is in touch with their own psychological depths is going to be more tolerant of uh, the diversity of sexual expression? I think that's true because they realize that there's a little bit of them in their own psyche. Mm -hmm. And I think they're also more tolerant across the board. Um, I can be tolerant of people of political parties and political groups that I'm consciously very much opposed to because I really, oh, there's a little bit of me that can understand that point of view. Mm -hmm. And the same thing of the religion. I'm sort of aghast at some of the horrors of mainstream religions, but then on the other hand, there's a little part of me that can understand the need for meaning and why people find that important in their lives. Mm -hmm. So I'm not putting myself up as the paragon of tolerance, but uh, what you say really resonates with me, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I should also say that even though I'm not a psychotherapist, 
I'm always appalled when I find out that friends of mine who have gone through psychotherapy have gone through the entire psychotherapy process without being questioned about their sexual preference mm -hmm. or their spirituality. Mm -hmm. These are two S's that I think are essential for successful psychotherapy. What's the person's spirituality? What's the person's sexuality? Mm -hmm. I just don't see how you can have a holistic psychotherapy without those two dimensions. Very important, and uh, what you're saying reminds me of another interview I did years ago with John Beebe, a Jungian psychotherapist in San Francisco who was gay and who uh, went through the Jungian training at a time when he was told that uh, it's not possible for a gay man to experience what the Jungians would call psychological integration, the goal of Jungian therapy. Yes. Ridiculous, isn't it? John B., outstanding, outstanding psychotherapist. He helped many, many people who I know. Also, you see, gay people can also have an animus or an anima. Mm -hmm. It does not necessarily mean just because you're gay you've discovered your animus or your anima and integrated. No, that's not it at all. Sexual preference and retaining your own gender identity means you still have an animus mm -hmm. or an anima to integrate. Yeah. So those have to be considered a little bit separately. Well, surely there are a certain class, I suppose you might say, of gay men who are hyper-masculine. Absolutely. And I've yeah. known some of them, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Never dreamed that they were gay because they don't conform to the stereotype. And then they confess their, I, their preference to me. Yeah. Of course, I don't make a big issue about it, but uh, I think, well, this just shows that the cultural stereotype can be wrong probably more often than it's right. Mm -hmm. Also, for some reason or another, a lot of people feel comfortable talking with me about experiences that they are very uncomfortable talking about with other people, mainly anomalous experiences like parapsychological experiences, but also sexual experiences. Mm -hmm and especially young people who sometimes think that maybe they're hypersexual, and I say, look, if you use safe sex, you have to realize that a lot of teenagers do have a lot of sex, and you've been taught probably that sex has to be associated with love. That's ideal, but in the real world, that doesn't often happen. But if you can't love your sexual partner, at least respect your sexual partner. And if you can't respect your sexual partner because your sexual partner is a prostitute, at least make sure it's consensual. If it's not consensual, don't do it. Hmm. I have no patience with people who engage in non-consensual sex because that gets into rape, it gets into pressure, it gets into political inspired sexual unions, that's mm -hmm. over the line. Mm -hmm. The other question I have is that um, as a parapsychologist and a sexologist, I've often suspected that there's, there's some important links between these two fields that haven't really been f explored adequately or explored hardly at all. And I'm thinking, for example, of a, a colleague, uh, uh, Whiteman of South Africa, who, mm -hmm. who was a brilliant mathematician and uh, an expert in out-of-body travel that yes. he seemed to do at will, mm -hmm. and his journals contain, I think, maybe 10,000 examples of his out-of-body travel, who claimed that he had, if I recall correctly, I think you know, mm -hmm. uh, a, when he traveled out of his body, his gender identity changed. Yes. John Whiteman, dear man, brilliant, brilliant person. And I am told that I'm one of the few people who he wrote to who used his female name in his letters. Mm -hmm. I was very honored because I hold him in such high respect. An excellent biography of him by John Poynton has been published recently for your it, listeners who it, want to learn more about him. And I recommend it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, he very successfully got in touch with his anima and lived, lived an integrated, wholesome, brilliant, eccentric, but uh, uh, contributory life. Mm -hmm. 
And let's talk a little bit about the, his his female identity. We have only about a minute left, but I, I think that it's related somehow to his extraordinary skill at out-of-body travel. Yes, I think it was. Again, when you are integrated in terms of your male and female parts, this grounds you for transcending them, at least in my opinion. And I know a number of people who have been specialists in outer body travel who are somewhat androgynous and who, I think, have that inner unity that gives them the security to travel out whatever that might mean, to travel out and to come back safely. Mm -hmm. Well, it suggests that perhaps in, in the future evolution of what hu human beings may become, maybe a million years in the future, androgyny will be the preferred result. Yes, who knows? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Stanley Krippner, this has been a most enjoyable conversation, uh, and, and I'm glad we've had a chance to discuss the topics that are is still on the edge of being taboo in our culture. Thank you so much for being with me. You are more than welcome. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.